Hey everyone, good afternoon. My name is Ramon Ray. Thank you so much for joining us on the Hub and Inc. webcast. We're going to be talking about Strike Back at the Hack, three ways your business can take a stand against cyber attacks. We're going to have a good time today. We have uh, three amazing, amazing panelists who are going to give us a lot of information and help us understand as business owners how to be more secure. I hope we even have a little bit of fun, uh, even though this is a very somber topic, but it's always good to have fun as well as we do business. So again, welcome. And um, you're going to notice that there's a question area. We definitely want to take your questions. Most all the questions we will answer towards the end of the webinar, probably at the 45-minute give or take mark. Uh, but if you have something really, really pertinent, you want to say, John, you know, Farley or, or Michelle or John Mullen, you know, if it's really important, we'll try to squeeze it in as we're going along. But again, thank you for joining us. And again, this is the Hub uh, a webinar brought to you by Inc., all about striking back at the hack three ways your business can take a stand against cyber attacks. I do want to say those of you who are socially active, and I'm sure it's about 99.9% .9 of you, we're using the hashtag strike back. So we encourage you to tweet while you're hearing something, something you like, tweet hashtag strike back and uh, share with others. And if you want to give some love to Hub, I would appreciate, it that, appreciate that. They would at Hub. Insurance, H U B Hub Insurance, and I'm at Ramon Ray. So with that, let's move on and begin. I want to introduce our panelists again. I'm Ramon Ray, an entrepreneur, and I could go on and on and on, but I've one of you. I started a few businesses, so I know about the need for us growing businesses to be secure. And uh, John, I'm really happy to uh, work with you. John, why don't you say hello, then we can make sure that uh, we hear you well. Hi, this is John Farley, Vice President, Cyber Risk Consulting at Hub International. Awesome. John, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. And I hope all is going well in your day. Awesome. And we have also Michelle. Michelle, welcome. Thank you for joining us also on the webinar. Why don't you say hello and, and give people a little snippet about your world, what you do. Hey, good, good afternoon. This is Michelle Opalato. I am the Senior Vice President and Director of Cyber and Technology Solutions here at Hub. Thank you very much, Michelle. Good to hear your voice and thanks for joining us today. And we also have John Mullen. John, welcome to the, today's webinar with Hub. Inc. and thank you for joining us and how's your day going so far? My day's going wonderfully guys. My, my, this is John and I'm the lawyer guy. You always have to have one of them. Awesome. So John that sounds that sounds like a like we should be like on a um, on an island together like battling it out. John the lawyer guy can't he withstand the sharks or something I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for joining us John and thank you uh, John Mullen, John Farley and Michelle. Uh, we're gonna have a great time today and we'll dive into it right now. So um, the agenda today, ladies and gentlemen, what we want to talk about are a few things. I think, one, we want to make sure we emphasize and, and make sure you all understand that no company is too small to get hacked. And by the way, I want to say thank you all. I see the questions already coming in. So John Mullen and John Farley and Michelle, we have a lot of questions that are coming in, and we're going to have a good time answering them as well. So the agenda today, we want to make sure you understand right at the beginning that no company is too small to get hacked, meaning we hear in the news a lot of big companies being hacked and et cetera. We don't hear about the smaller companies necessarily, but all of us are susceptible to being hacked. Point number two we want to talk about in the agenda today is really not just to talk about that you can be hacked. We want to help you understand how to protect yourself, and we're going to have a good time on that, really going over some points of how you can protect yourself. Third thing we want to talk about is how you can transfer your company's risk, how you can make sure that even if you are attacked, how you can better protect yourself by working with others to help you make sure you have a full suite of protection as it regards to security. Number four, if you happen to get hacked, if you happen to get breached, and that probably will happen, what in the world can you do about it? So we want to go over that. And last but not least, really, we want to talk about a few ways that your business is at risk and what to do about it. So that's our agenda today. As I said, we're going to have a good time, a lot of information. Let's dive into it. Point number one here, the real thing to understand, no company is too small to get hacked. I think that's a very important part to bring out, and I think sometimes we feel that, you know, I'm too small, nobody wants to target me, it's just the big companies. Well, that's not necessarily true, John Farley. I mean, studies tell us that, and people can look on the slide here, 55%, John, of 600 in a survey, small to mid-sized businesses surveyed, reported being hacked. John, that's a lot of small businesses being hacked. What does that mean to you? Help us unpack that. Sure. Thanks, Ramon. Um, yeah, so really what it comes down to is, look, what we're hearing in the news are the name brand companies, right? They're the ones that make the news. However, as you can see from the studies, study after study shows that hackers are after everyone 
and in fact go out of their way to go after the small companies. And if you think about it from the hacker's lens, if I want to steal credit cards and I can steal them from Walmart or I can steal them from a mom and pop, who's going to have the greater defenses? Who's going to have more resources? Who's going to make it more difficult for me? It's going to be the large company. So why not target the small company? That credit card that I steal is going to have the same value on the dark web when I try to sell it. So it really doesn't matter where it comes from. So why not go after the small business? And I think, John, that's a great point. You know, sometimes we think, oh, it's the bigger business, more value, whatever. But you're right. At the end of the day, on an individual level, heck, John's individual credit card or a credit card from big company X, it's all the same value, right? Right. Yeah, no, for sure. Thanks, John. So, uh, John Mullen, I want to turn to you, this aspect of why ha hackers are targeting small businesses. I mean, John Farley unpacked it, but, John, I want to turn to you, kind of the lawyer in our group here. Um, one, and I'll just go over the slide for those who are dialing in, but hackers probably aren't targeting you specifically. Three things we're bringing out. One, they often attack many businesses at once, so they're doing it in mass. Two, they just want any data that's valuable, and I think, John, this is personally identifiable information, but you can correct me in a minute if I'm wrong, W-2 forms, credit cards, all those kind of things. And as John Farley said, they just want to steal anything they can get their money, on, their hands on. So, John Mullen, unpack this for us about the why is this such a big industry for these hackers. Well, I'll also give you a little bit of a factoid. This is not from studies. This is from actual experience. This year, my firm will handle, give or take, a 1,000 data breaches. Wow. We get four to five every single day. And I will tell you, of that thousand, round number, that 95% of them are what you would consider small to middle-sized businesses. Very few are the big monster cases. So that's keeping 24 lawyers very, very busy for you know, years at a time. So the reality on the ground is most data privacy events slash breaches happen to smaller companies, not big ones. Another thing to think about before we unpack too much is even if you don't get breached, even if you don't get hacked, which may or may not happen on any given year, uh, your vendors may well. Uh, my, my firm has about 40 employees, and within a year of being in existence, we had a vendor who did our, some of our benefits get hacked and lose all the data about all of our employees. Now, we were at least arguably, perfect. We didn't do anything wrong. And yet, all that data went out the door because someone else did. So if you get lucky and dodge the bullet, will every vendor that you deal with, payroll or otherwise, will they all dodge the same bullet? You know, unlikely, right? In terms of how this all works, the reality is this. The bad guys are out there. They don't really care about your business or, frankly, my business. But what they do do is they'll send something out and say, hey, tell me all the companies, all the computers in the world, that are attached to, that have this software, XP, whatever it is. They come back, ah, there's 10 million of them, great. Now here's their patch, the latest patch. Tell me of those 10 million, how many didn't do the patch? Oh, 50,000 didn't. Well, they just went from 10 million users of a certain software package to 50,000. Now they start to sharpen their pencils a little bit and figure out where they want to go within that 50,000 pool. Much, much easier. Their next search could be, okay, well, tell me of those 50,000, which ones are in the United States? Okay, now we're down to 12,000, et cetera, et cetera. All that's done it, with a few keystrokes, guys. That doesn't even take enough, you know, a coffee break to do. So this is not real hard for them. And where would you go? If you're going to steal gold, you stealing it from Fort Knox? You know, you're going to bring an army with you. Or you're going to take money from the local credit union in the middle of nowhere, Iowa or Pennsylvania. So that's kind of the way the realities are, as John was indicating earlier. It's the, the point of least resistance, and that's frankly the point of lowest budget and lowest focus, and that's small business, middle-sized middle businesses. Yeah, no, John, this is amazing. John Mullen, I'm just curious as well. In brief, when you get these kind of calls, what is it like? I'm guessing it's either a bit of confusion, they're not sure, or it's heart-wrenching. Can you just briefly, you know, you're at the forefront when something happens, you're probably one of the first person that they call. What is that like for you and your firm and the people who answer the phones at your company? Well, yeah, we actually are on the other end of the hotlines that all the insurance carriers put into their insurance policies for cyber. And uh, to, to, put it, to put it mildly, people are unbelievably stressed. You get on the horn, you've got somebody who might be, you know, wear three hats, uh, chief operating officer, CFO, and something else. You know, they don't know what to do. They don't know where to start. They don't know who gets fired or are they getting fired. They have no idea what's really going on. Who do they have to tell? Do they have to tell their clients, et cetera, et cetera. So panic is a fair way of putting it. 
And that's not an exaggeration because, uh, you know, we do it, like I said, four or five times a day we have those calls. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you, John Mullen, for that. John Farley, listen, John Mullen's talked about, you know, the calls he's getting and, and et cetera. Um, going back to you, John, and what you're seeing and the work you guys do at Hub, what are some of the ways that people are breaking in? I mean, breaking in all, many of us have heard these terms Fishing. I mean, John Farley, before I heard of fishing like years ago, I'm like, that's what I used to do in Ohio when I was a kid once or twice. But we've heard of fishing. You have social engineering, um, you know, which is really a devious uh, way of doing things. You have ransomware, which we all heard of, and I think it probably panics many of us, like hearing the word Ebola. Help us understand what are these ways that people are, that, that businesses are being broken into. Help us understand that. Sure, sure. So there's lots of ways that they break in, but these are probably the most common. So a phishing attack really mostly involves an email. So it's, think of it in terms of like a Hail Mary pass. What the hacker does is send a phishing email out to perhaps tens of thousands of people, and in that email there's an infected attachment or an infected link containing malware. And they're hoping that some percentage of that population clicks on that link or, or that attachment, and thereby that allows malware to enter the network and take control of data, exfiltrate data, do all sorts of bad things. Um, that's phishing. But then you get into more targeted social engineering attacks, right? So social engineering attacks essentially play on our natural tendencies to trust other people, right? So what this means is they'll go in and take over often a CEO's email account or they'll send an email that's very similar looking to the CEO and they'll target individuals within the organization. So the email will go to the director of HR. And in that email, they'll say, hey, send me everybody's W-2 form. And that person in HR believes the CEO demanding it, and they immediately send a file containing everybody's W-2 form. Mm -hmm. So what does the hacker do there, right? They then file tax returns and steal the returns. Then they take the data elements that are on that form and commit further identity theft. So that's one way they do it, but then they're also after funds, they're after money. So they may impersonate the CEO and send an email to the accounting department, and they may say, okay, Mr. Accounting Department, send me $10,000, but send it to our new bank over in China. We've just set it up, please uh, uh, deposit it there. And they do it. So they steal funds and they steal money through social engineering uh, attempts. And then finally, we ransomware. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Anybody want to jump no, in? No, no, I, I had a question. I was I was just depressed and shocked about all these ways. Please continue. Okay. It's like a horror movie, I know. Uh, <laughs> but ransomware, <laughs> ransomware is another way they do it. It's um, a way where they send an email that has an, an attachment or a link that's infected with a kind of malware that essentially, when it's clicked upon, takes control of your data, locks it down with an encryption key that's only known by the hacker. So if you're that, that victim company... Uh, you have a choice to make. You have to decide, okay, do I have a backup? Can I access that backup? And, and that's, that's what you hopefully have. But many of our clients have not had the backup in place and had to deal with the extortion attempt then that follows. So the hacker then says, hey, if you want your data back, I'll give you the decryption key, but you've got to pay me money. And you've got to pay me in the form of Bitcoin, which is an alternative currency, which who knows how to get Bitcoin, right? And mm -hmm. so you have a lot of issues going on. Meanwhile, your business is shut down. You can't operate because you're relying on your data. What are you going to do? Do you pay the hacker? Well, uh, uh, the FBI will tell you never to pay the hacker uh, because, first of all, you're going to perpetuate a crime. And second of all, you don't know if you can trust that criminal on the other end, right? You might pay them and never hear from them again. So it's not a good situation to be in, uh, in a ransomware attack. Yeah, John, I mean, and again, I know that Michelle and John Mullen will talk about some of these things, what to do after you hack, but I'm curious, John Farley, I mean, how do you live your life? Like when your mom calls, do you ask her to authenticate herself and to say the last book she read to you as a child? How do we, how do we live? I mean, when your buddy sends you the picture of your kid at baseball practice, do you say, no, send it to me through the postal service? I'm, I'm talking kind of in jest here, but in brief, John, what, how do you live your life with all these threats at businesses? What do we do? And, and, you know, it's, it's crazy. I know it's crazy. You know what? There are some simple solutions, though. I mean, really, and the illustration I gave you before about the W-2 forms, right? I mean, a simple phone call to the person requesting it, right, can, can you know, highlight, you know, a, a crime happening. You know, you'll know right away that this was not coming from the CEO. So there should be a, a multi-step process in place. If you're going to transfer funds, you know what, if it's over a certain amount, make the phone call to make sure it's legit. 
So that's really some simple ways. No, very good. No, thank you very much. And we have a, a lot more to discuss here, ladies and gentlemen. I can see that the, the call hopefully is going well. Uh, definitely more and more people are signing on. And those of you who signed on a bit late again, this is the uh, Hub Insurance uh, webinar we're doing in conjunction with brought to you by Inc. Magazine. And I encourage you, if you hear something that you like, um, please go ahead and tweet it out. Use the hashtag um, strike back. Hashtag strike back. Definitely we'll look at that and retweet it out. Words and etc. My Twitter handle is at Ramon Ray, and definitely you can give a hub some love and say thanks to them at Hub Insurance. So definitely we want you to feel free to be engaged while you're hearing uh, these things. We're going to get to some good solutions too. John, Michelle, and I, and John are not just going to talk about the negative side, but we have some answers for you as well. So John Farley, um, expect more breaches. 38,000 known vulnerabilities exist today, John, and the Internet of Things. This is the things you know, John, the cameras you have, your cars, your refrigerator, your fancy clock radio, connect to your phone, just connect to your dog kennel, all these things, they're increasing the number of entry points. So uh, help us understand, again, it seems like breaches are expanding, expanding. What, what are some things we need to understand in regards to this? Yeah, so, so absolutely. With the concept of the Internet of Things, the attack surface expands on a daily basis for the hacker. They've simply got more ways to get in. Uh, the average home has 13 Internet-connected devices, and that number continues to grow. So, again, if it's connected, it's vulnerable. You don't just have to worry about your laptop. It's, it's your thermostat. It's your security cameras. It's your appliances and, and so many more things. So, so the attack surface is growing. Um, more things to worry about. And really, you know, a lot of these manufacturers of these products are rushing to the market, right? They're concerned about getting the product out there. Cybersecurity often takes a back seat. So they're not even thinking about how to secure the device. They want to get the device out. Um, and we're eager to buy them, right? We've got how many of these in our home. So the, uh, the smart home is not so secure is what I would kind of like to say. Yeah, absolutely. Michelle, I have a question for you. Uh, Michelle, I recently got a, uh, an internet security device for, for my home. I, I play with a lot of these gadgets. But Michelle, I unplugged it because I realized I didn't know who it was from. It wasn't from like a name branded vendor that we all know for years. It was somebody that was new to the market. Was I too paranoid, Michelle, do you think? Or, you know, without knowing the details, do you think I did the right thing by unplugging it and kind of thinking twice? But by all means, you can't be too paranoid, unfortunately. And, and to John's point, it just takes a couple of simple measures to maybe use that as a backstop so those, these things do not occur. I feel um, better. I, I think <laughs> I'll keep it plugged. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Maybe that's the safest way to go. Um, but I, I think something to be really uh, mindful of is a breach of just 25,000 records could cost companies about $250,000. And you mm -hmm. know what? That's just you know, when you think of it, the initial response, okay, that is just bringing in the lawyer guy, John Mullen, right, to help you navigate the patchwork of law that we have in this country. It's bringing in a data forensics team to identify where that breach occurred and what data was affected. It's bringing in a PR team to help you set the strategy on the press, making sure, you know, that you're getting that good news out in front of the bad news and you're, you're really mitigating any potential reputational harm. Um, and, you know, it's also providing notification, credit card monitoring, setting up a call center, all of those things you really have to, uh, you incur those expenses just to react to this breach. But that's not the end of it. There's more. Uh, you know, you could have additional costs because you have the regulatory investigation. And by that, I mean it could be the state attorney general. It could be several state attorneys general because we do not have one federal data breach law and it could be any other regulator that has oversight over the type of data that was breached. So we're talking, you know, uh, we have Health and Human Services in the Office of Civil Rights and Healthcare, we have the SEC, we have uh, FINRA, we have no shortage of regulatory bodies that are interested in coming and investigating. Um, and side note, a lot of these agencies are self-funded and they are growing with those fines and penalties that they're levying. So, um, so, and on top of that, you know, there could be a, additional costs just to defend against a lawsuit if you're hit with one. So, this 250,000 number is very real, but by no means is it the overall cost that you'll be looking at. So, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is going to be a costly uh, event to get through. Yeah, it looks like the reality of the day. Does it make sense, Michelle, that, you know, in the same way that as companies, I'm an entrepreneur, you're in business, there's some insurances that are mandated, I believe, some insurances are good to have. Do you think that, I know we're going to talk about this a bit later on in the webinar, but I'm curious while we're on this point, do you think then that since hacking and hackers, this is on the rise, it's a fact, 
you and John and John have talked about this. We set the stage for that. Does it make sense in that as a course of business, all businesses highly consider, if almost mandated, to, to look at their insurance for these type of things? Is that, is, that a, is that too far of a stretch or has the time come when just about every business needs to make a regular course of practice to look at their insurance for cybersecurity? No, you know what, Ramon, the reality is it's a necessity. I mean, you know, I tell my clients that it's a three-step process. You know, they want to, first and foremost, they want to make sure that their controls, their securities, everything is buttoned up that they can possibly button up, right? They want to look at ways that they can mitigate um, these types of events when they occur. So whether it's a business continuity plan or disaster recovery plan, you know, testing of those plans, a breach incidents response plans, making sure that they're really ready to, to um, go into you know, the response mode when these events happen. But as a third step, and I, I tell all my clients, you know, transfer this risk off your balance sheet. If you don't have to pay for it off your balance sheet and you can keep your, your company running after a, a devastating event like this, why wouldn't you? And that's where the insurance product comes in. So I, I think it's a necessity. Thank you, Michelle. And we have a lot of questions coming in, John, uh, Mullen, John Farley, and Michelle. So thank you all so much. Those of you who are listening, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you on this webinar. So please keep your questions coming in. I see some of them. I'm tempted to say, Michelle, can you answer this question quick? But I know the, I'll open the floodgates. So please keep sending in your questions. I will get to as many as I can. These are some amazing, amazing questions that I know John and Michelle and John can answer quite. Uh, I like big words, Michelle. I'll say ardently, but I think that's the wrong word. So quite astutely, I'll use that word. So let us move on with the webinar today. Um, so number two, we talked, we set the stage for what the problems are, made us aware. So let's turn the stage, turn the page really. How can we protect ourselves from a breach? I mean, this is really the, the, the bottom line here. And for those who are dialing in, just to read it, a put a plan in, put a put a plan in place before the attack comes. It seems like that's really it's like not waiting until the attack happens. But what we're trying to do in this call that Hub is bringing to us, brought to you by Inc., is we're really trying to explain, listen, you don't have to wait until it's too late. There's things you can do ahead of time, things you can do right now. So, John Farley, I'm going to turn to you again, and then, Michelle, please come in after John's uh, finished with his comments. But, John, walk us through some of the practical things, the steps we should do to prepare ourselves before we get breached. Sure, sure. So, from a technology perspective, one of the best ways to figure out where you might be vulnerable would be to bring in a white hat hacker. Okay, so these are good guys that know how the bad guys operate, right? So they have the skills to hack. And you can hire these guys to come in and try to hack you to figure out where am I vulnerable. They can teach you where you're vulnerable and teach you ways to remediate those vulnerabilities. It's called pen testing or penetration testing. So that's one way from a technology perspective, but Really, it also goes beyond that, right? So you want to educate your staff. Hackers have figured out that, you know, I don't just have to attack the back rooms of the IT department to get the data that I want. I can directly engage employees with phishing emails that I highlighted before. So what you need to do is educate your staff to recognize the threat, to recognize phishing emails, right? If someone's requesting W-2 forms, think twice, right? Or asking you to transfer funds. So there really has to be periodic testing and, and uh, periodic training of your employees. And then finally, back up your data. Ransomware is an epidemic. This is going to continue. It's going to get worse. So you need to back up your data. If you become a victim, you want to be able to access that backup, make sure that it's air-gapped in a way that it can't be affected by a ransomware attack and you can quickly access it. Because again, you don't want to be in a situation where you're negotiating with a hacker who may be demanding millions of dollars to free up your, your data. So back up your data is really important. Michelle? That's right. hey, absolutely. Number four, you know, update your security patches. You know, I can't think of anything that, that speaks to more or basic cyber hygiene, but also it's such a necessity. You know, if you've been watching the news, in May and June, we had two very, very large-scale ransomware events that occurred. We had the WannaCry ransomware event, and then we had the Petya, not Petya event. In some cases, it was called the Golden Eye because it looked like 007 type of event. And what happened is that entities that did not update their patches, patches that were available, by the way, since March of 2017, they were marked as vulnerable. Those vulnerabilities were exploited by these, uh, by these attacks. Nearly 200,000 computers were affected in over 150 countries. 
So I can't stress the importance to make sure that you're, you're doing these basic hygiene type of items um, for your controls and your securities because it will eliminate that threat vector, at least for that vulnerability from your business. You know, and in addition to that, install antivirus software, firewalls. Again, this is some of the basic stuff that, that's available out there. As long as you're staying on top of it, you can eliminate a lot of these threat vectors. So, you know, again, simple steps. Awesome. And I hope that everyone's taking note of these and feel free to go back to them and, and, and share these with your team. So, John Mullen, um, you know, what are some ways that you're finding some of the best ways to respond to an attack? And I will say one of the questions was, why not just pay off the hacker? I think, John Mullen, you answered that, I think, already. But help us understand what you're saying is, is how to respond to attack. And I will just review the PowerPoint for those dialing in audio only, maybe. Include, a key, include key contact numbers. Create a strategy for notifying affected uh, customers. Use the plan as a roadmap for risk management planning. Uh, what, what more can we, should we know, John Mullen? Yeah, I mean, the short version is this. Know what you know and know what you don't know, right? Use the right experts, uh, Michelle and John being two of them. So when, when we get these calls, and like I said, you know, a thousand a year, when we get these, uh, a, a handful of them come in without insurance. They're referred through, you know, word of mouth or whatever the case may be, a prior client. Uh, think about how stressed you are when you get hacked and your systems are down and you have Michelle or John to call who placed cyber insurance for you last year. You're freaking out. And then you get on the phone with us and, and things start to evolve and it becomes clear there's a plan and whatnot. Um, think about the people who call us without the coverage. So if you're panicked and you know you have a backstop of insurance to pay for most of it, if not all, imagine how you feel when you call us and you don't. So just consider that as you go through there. Um, you know, the, the short version is this. You should plan, uh, have, a, have a general plan. We call them incident response plans. You can, there's a million places you can get them. They don't have to be perfect and they don't have to be long. But have a general set of, of options. What are we going to do if and when this happens? And write it up and update it, and not only will that help you on that day, you know, what's my broker's number, uh, what insurance do I have, et cetera, but it will also help you if on that day, you know, everything blows up on you, and down the road you're being investigated by a regulator, and you show them that you took the trouble to do an incident response plan, and that gives you sort of a stamp of credibility. These regulators are looking to pick on people, and they will pick on people who they think ignored the whole issue. So if you can show some due diligence, none of us are perfect, but if you can show it, you're less likely to become a target for a regulator. Regulators are probably involved in 70% of our cases. That doesn't mean they, 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 they come on and they beat you up. It means they ask some questions and you give them an answer. And if you don't have the right answer, that's when they ask more questions. So the whole goal with regulators is to satisfy them and make them move on to somebody else who has a bigger problem or cared less. So in the short term, you know, that's what I would do. I would also encourage you on that backup issue that John was talking about before, make sure the backup is not only remote, but it's also not connected all the time to your systems because we've seen a lot of the more sophisticated ransomware come in and figure out a way to get across data lines and lock down the backups as well. So backup is a tremendously important thing, but make sure you have a copy that's not otherwise connected to your system. So those are just some of the things. I will tell you this. Everything you do, you should document because, again, it's not perfect. It might be ugly, but documenting and showing that you cared and showing that you had a plan will help you down the road when I'm defending you from a regulator's inquiry. They will take you more seriously if you take this more seriously. This is amazing, John, and I can see here definitely I'm learning as I do through this webinar. There's a nice blend of the law, legal issues, and et cetera, and the blend of what you do technologically and et cetera. So and I would encourage everyone, as you guys are listening, I know we're dropping a lot of science on you, but I would assume, you know, check out Hub's website. I bet they have a lot of resources on there. I know for sure Inc. has written boatloads about this. So as you're now hearing this and being more aware, go back to the amazing resources we have available for you and you know, uh, and, and, and fill in the holes that are missing and definitely talk to Hub and, and the people here on this uh, webinar here are here to help you. Michelle, um, you know, who's most at risk? When we think about um, business owners, I know nobody can take uh, a seat back and nobody can rest their laurels at all, but I'm sure there's maybe a few types of businesses that you may say, Ramon, let's highlight, underline some of these industries. Can you talk about that a bit? 100%. Just like you said, no one can rest on their laurels because the really short answer to that question is all companies have risk, and, and I stand behind that statement. Um, but to be specific, if any company that has any private 
data in their care, custody, custody or control. They're vulnerable. You know, it, it could be their employee data of, of, you know, all their employees, their personnel files. It could be your customer data, you know, which would include all of that personally identifiable information like bank data, names, social security numbers, emails, passwords, um, credential information, uh, additionally credit card data, medical data, all of that that we as companies really need to function, right? Um, that makes us all vulnerable, but specifically, the, the companies that have that, it's going to be the, and no surprise here, it's going to be those retailer or merchant companies, financial institutions, um, surprisingly not-for-profits have an inordinate amount of, in many cases, healthcare information or personally identifiable information. Um, you know, small medical offices are known to have a ton of not just electronic medical records, but the paper records too. I'm not sure if, if a lot of our listeners understand this, but privacy law is triggered not only by electronic information, but the paper information as well. So any private information that's in the care custody control makes you vulnerable. And something to point out here is, even if you as a company rely on a lot of third-party service providers, which we have to, right? We have to rely on other vendors to assist us to function on a daily basis. If your vendor is responsible for, for a breach and it's their error or omission that causes it, at the end of the day, privacy law is going to be following the data owner or the quote-unquote storefront. So you really need to understand where that liability is and how much you're taking on. Um, you know, companies that are not so big but rich in data are just really nice paydays and targets for these malicious actors. And the mm -hmm. vulnerabilities are usually greater, and it, it means it's an easier target, just like John um, Farley was saying earlier, than their much larger company counterparts. Yeah, no, thank you, Michelle. And it appears what I'm, what I'm hearing, if I'm wrong, you know, my wife will say every day, Michelle, that I hear her wrong. So if I'm wrong, Michelle, you can correct me let me know. But <laughs> what I'm hearing... You say, Michelle, what I'm hearing every the conversation so far. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about the halfway mark, so keep sending your questions in. We're going to get to Q&A in about 10, 15 minutes. We'll, we're at the downward slope of our webinar. We've had a lot of good information. But, Michelle, there's the technology part we need to do, educating our customers, things that John Mullen and Farley have talked about. But it appears to be that we can do everything right, still be hacked, still have problems. And what, what I'm understanding is that's where kind of insurance comes in, this act, the aspect of transferring risk to another partner, which would be an insurance company that can help us if we are uh, hacked. Am I, am I hearing that correctly? I think that you are hearing it correctly. Your, your wife might disagree, but I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so help us understand and break this down. What it says on the next slide here, you know, without the right coverage, the odds of surviving a breach are not good. 60% of improperly insured businesses close permanently. 60% of those who are improperly insured, 6-0, close permanently following a cyber attack. So, Michelle, what do we do? How do we, how do we reduce this happening to our businesses? Yeah, you know, th that number is devastating, right? And, and it, the reality is, is because the cost to, to comply with these data breaches can be so expensive, and, and as a side note, the longer it takes for you to really address the cyber breach, the more money it is costing you by the minute almost, um, it's going to be a very big impact to your balance sheet. So having that insurance product is really the backstop for you. Okay? It, it's going to ensure that your balance sheet is protected. It's going to ensure that you can keep you know, functioning as a business, service your customers, your clients, whatever it is, whatever it's going to take, so that you can keep moving forward and let the insurance company, let their vendors, let, let their, their panel counsel really walk you through this process and take that on for themselves. Um, you know, it, it, there's just so much. I, I talked earlier about those, those costs that you are going to incur the moment that the breach happens, um, you know, 250000 and that's just, you know, the, the first foot in the door. You know, at the end of the day, the goal is to continue to function as a business after this type of event, and you really can't do that if you are spending all of your balance sheet to do that. Yeah, and you had talked earlier, uh, Michelle, following on the next slide here about that, you know, it's not just people think, oh, something happened, the insurance company cuts me a check for X. But there's a lot of other things that your insurance company can help with. You know, it's not just here's money to recoup this. There's uh, lawyers you may need, forensic experts you may need, PR firms, all kind of things you might need that your insurance company, your partner, as I'm seeing this, can help with. Um, help us understand that it's, it's more really that I'm, I'm seeing here more than just the money, more than just insurance payment, correct? 
Absolutely. So I, I would say at this point in time that most of the carriers and the insurance products that are available on the market today are what I, I like to term as a turnkey product. So when you're getting this policy, you're not getting the coverage for these types of events, which is critical, right? You're also getting access to professionals who have handled these types of events hundreds if not thousands of times. These types of events are unlike anything that, as a business owner, you've probably dealt with. It's not a general liability trip and fall. It's not, you know, a fire occurs at your business. This is something that you may not have dealt with before, and, and really addressing it quickly and correctly is going to save you a lot of time, effort, and headaches. So when you get these types of policies, the majority of them are going to have a 24-hour hotline that is available to you when you either know that you have a breach or you, even if you just suspect that there might be a breach, you're gonna call that hotline and you know what you're gonna get? You're gonna get John Mullen or one of his team members on the other side of that line and they're going to help you qualify whether or not it is a breach and if there are any laws that you are in non-compliance of and what you need to do next. And from there, you are going to have that privacy attorney act as your data breach coach and they are going to coordinate, coordinate the efforts of that entire event. They will bring in the vendors for your forensics team's investigation. They will bring in the PR team. They will set up the notification letters. They will provide the credit card monitoring, um, the ID theft remediation, as well as setting up a call center. So all of that is super, super valuable. And I will say one additional benefit that's, that's key to have here, when you have John Mullen and his team or you know, the lawyer guys setting up these, um, these vendors on your behalf, you're now protected under attorney-client privilege. So anything that's found in that forensics investigation is no longer discoverable. That's super valuable. So I think when you, when you look at it from that perspective that these policies are, are really here to assist and help you and they're with vendors who I consider the gold standard across the country and have been through this time and time again. To John Mullen's point, I mean, he's, he's doing, you know, handling about five to ten of these on, on an average weekly basis. So they've been through the ringer on this and they know how to handle it. Now, Michelle, thank you very much. This is amazing. Uh, John, we're going to have a, a discussion here, ladies and gentlemen, on the webinar. Sit up, take notice. We're going to talk about the law now. I think, John, there's three core things if you could bring out for us. I think one really is what to do and expect following a breach. Uh, summarize and, and pack that for us. The second thing we're going to talk about, John Mullen, is the aspect of it, there's going to be legal confusion. And I know you're going to give some points to help us understand how to navigate this on this short webinar as best you can, but that's the other uh, bucket that I see here. And the third thing we're going to talk about briefly, ladies and gentlemen, these few minutes here as we're going, uh, we're on slide number four, is the aspect of lawsuits. So, uh, John Mullen, I'll turn it over to you to kind of walk us through this aspect of, of, of point number one, what to do and expect following a, a, a breach in brief, because I know a lot of people are sending in questions, so we want to um, move on to their questions as well. Great. I'll fire this right at you. Uh, here's the short version. You call the 800 number. You let your broker know what's happening. The 800 number will connect to us. Five minutes ago, we got a call on one of those 800 numbers while we've all been talking. We already clear conflicts. We've got a call set up with that entity for 25 minutes from now. You jump on the horn with them. You establish attorney-client privilege. You explain to them this is what we do for a living, so you know we try to be really good at it. And then you explain, you understand their business quickly. Tell us about your business. We've already Googled you. Tell us what's going on. We're going to interrupt you. You come to the end of that call. And you have an immediate plan put in front of you as the business owner. Okay, you told us who you are. You told us what's going on. We asked our questions. Here's the plan. And immediately we will roll in forensics, meaning while we're on call one with you, and we be it becomes clear to us you're going to need some forensic help of some sort, we're already emailing the approved forensic vendors under your insurance policy. We know who they are. And we're mm -hmm. already lining that phone call up. So we get off that first phone call in, let's say, 30 minutes, take a bathroom break, and grab a bottle of water, you're on the next call with forensics. At the end of that call, they start working remotely with you, all done, all under privilege, all within minutes or an hour or two, and it includes evenings and weekends. So that's really what happens. You, you get a, a hold of us. We coordinate with your broker. We, through your broker and the carrier, will understand what your coverages are. We then engage forensics typically, and then as we're imagining that forensics, and by the, by the way, this is a business problem, not a legal problem. There are legal issues, but it's really about keeping the business running, about keeping the business running healthily. So we, we get that. 
So as we're going through it and getting your company safe via a forensic vendor and using experts only, and we only can have access to the experts, and these are all national companies who do this and only this for a living. You know, we, we roll through that. As all that's happening, we're identifying any legal duties that may have popped up, and we'll touch on that in a moment, and making sure that to the extent there are legal duties, you're going to hit any deadlines and comply as needed. The whole point here is to get your company safe, keep it running, or get it back up and running, and to make you as bulletproof as you can be considering the fact that you've had a problem in the first place. So that's really what happens when a breach occurs if you're lined up and have the right resources available. And to Michelle's point, the insurance companies have now been writing these policies for 15 years, so they have long since figured out which forensic companies, which law firms actually know what they're doing. There's a million companies out there claiming to know, but the carriers, because it's about the bottom line and keeping their insured clients happy, have long ago figured out who the good experts are and what an expert really looks like in this space. John, I know you've condensed this into a short amount of time. You've done a great job, and I I think I feel comforted, comforted, if I can speak on behalf of a couple hundred other people, that even though this is a painful process, uh, akin to, I don't know, childbirth, building a house, something like that, but it it seems comforting that there is a process. And so uh, that's comforting to me. I'm going to move on. I think you've already talked about uh, handling lawsuits, and the the job is to get back to business. But the last slide, if I may, if you want me to go back, I can. This aspect of legal confusion, why don't you touch on that a bit for us? We can kind of understand what that's all about. Yeah, there's 48 different state laws, and they're all different. That's, that's one part of the confusion. The second part is there are a bunch of federal laws that overlie the state laws, and they don't exclude the state laws. So when you have a health care problem and you're a covered entity or a, business ex- or a business associate, you have a HIPAA problem, and you have a problem with 48 state laws. So on top of that, you have almost no case law, meaning no judges have yet looked at all these new laws, because they're all in the last dozen years or so, and said, well, here's what I think this really means. So you've got laws that are new, that keep changing. No judges have yet ruled in on what they really mean, so it's, a, it's the Wild West in terms of interpreting them. You've got federal and state laws, and to make it even more confusing, now you have a boatload of contracts that lawyers are firing back and forth when you're engaging vendors or selling your services or buying services or things or dealing with unions. You name, you name it, and there are all kinds of funky contract clauses that are out there. So you've got state law. You've got federal law, and you've got contract law, all in the mix, all uninterpreted. Try to figure that one out on the fly, especially since in the last year and a half alone, a dozen states changed their laws. So not only were the laws new, they changed them. So you're trying to manage all that and all the deadlines that come with that, while, oh, by the way, you're trying to get your business up and running. So, you know, where is the priority there? Let's get your business up and running. But at the same time, some of those laws – have, have notice requirements where you have to tell regulators or people within 72 hours or you're in violation of a statute. So there is just a lot going on with respect to the laws, and I probably confused you enough to make the point on it. No, <laughs> no but I think what it means is every business should have a partner to help them navigate through this. Uh, John Muller, let's talk about the aspect of lawsuits. I know that was a question I saw in some of the comments, and I know there's a lot to talk about it, but I mean, People are wondering, can I be sued? Will I be sued? How do I is mitigate? Can I use that word? I'm not a lawyer, John, but mitigate being sure. sued. Help us understand this aspect of lawsuits now. We talked about the government and the states. Okay, thanks for that. Now what about everybody else who may want to sue us? What do we do about that? Yeah, so here's a short version. Not that many, a low percentage, 1% or 2% of these cases turn into lawsuits. So that's okay. good news. Uh, the, the bad news is that those numbers are going up. So, so they're very defensible today, although less than they, it was easier to win them five years ago than it is today. And in three or four more years, it'll be really hard to win them. But right now, you can win those suits. You're also unlikely to be sued unless you lose millions of credit cards or, in the case of health care or Social Security numbers, in the tens of thousands. So if you lose 3,000 records, you're probably not getting sued unless you have really bad luck with a local union or something like that. Uh, so, you know, don't, I wouldn't freak out about lawsuits. They're a reality. But the reality is plaintiff's attorneys in class actions are looking to do what I call perform legal blackmail. That's what it is. 
They're looking sure. for a big enough number that they can leverage that number and freak you out and, and get money out of you to make it go away. So unless you've lost, you know, tens of thousands or more of records, which a lot of small companies have access to, mind you, because it's not always the access. It's not the data always in your data banks. It's also data you have access to. So to the extent you have access to systems of others, other companies, that all comes into play. So what the, what the short version is, lawsuits are bad. They're very expensive, but they're not super common just yet. I want to read the John Mullen Guide to Not Being Sued or whatever book you want to write. I just want to read it. So, um, now, you know, well, hey, Ramon, let me make one quick point. Please, As please, much as I please. tell you that the, the, the percent of lawsuits is 1% or 2%, the percentage, I might have said this before, of regulatory inquiry, meaning some regulator writes a letter or picks up a phone, that's like 75%. So even uh-huh. if you're a small, small operation and you have a, a, a breach with 500 people in it, not a big deal, right? You right. will get investigated right. by some of the regulators because I think we did say this. It's not about where your company is located. It's about where the people live whose data you possess, right? And when you have to do notice to people throughout the country, even if there's only 500 of them, you, about half the time, you also have to tell the regulators in those states, so if you have, lose somebody's data from Connecticut or New York, you've got to write the attorneys general and tell them you lost it. So it's not a pleasant experience. Yeah, no, I, I hear in that it doesn't sound pleasant, but it, but it sounds uh, survivable with, with, with help, and thank you for that. Uh, Michelle, there's, there's different types of coverage that I think businesses uh, can consider and, and should know about. As we come towards the end of this webinar and I get ready to open up for a lot of the questions coming in, and thank you all so much for your questions. Thank you for tweeting at hashtag strike back. Thank you for giving our the Hub uh, Twitter handle some love, at Hub Insurance. And again, you know, big thanks to Inc. for producing this. But we have some more to go, so hang tight. We're going to get your questions and answer them. Uh, Michelle, walk us through the different types of insurance. I know there's three six, seven, eight different types. Maybe uh, go over all of them, or if you want to highlight one or two, uh, however you wish to do it. But I'll, I'll move forward as I hear you mention each one. The floor is yours. Absolutely. So I, I'm going to go over all of them. And just to be clear, these are different types of insuring agreements that are all available under one policy. You could consider not purchasing them all. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. Um, so I'm going to go through these. And, and just to give you a little background, in a short amount of time, when we look at the history of insurance, you know, cyber's only been here 10 to 15 years. But in that short amount of time, it's evolved very, very quickly into a robust policy form that provides coverage for third-party liability as well as first-party expense. The third-party liability that I'm going to talk about is financial harm that comes to a third party because of your failure, error, omission, or negligence in doing or not doing something. So when it comes to privacy liability, it's your failure, error, omission from keeping private, confidential, sensitive information staying that way. So if you have any type of disclosure of private information, you can be held liable for that. Wow. What that means. Yeah, you can have lawsuit looking at you, just as John Mullen. You know, it may take a lot of records to have that lawsuit you know, be brought against you, but when that occurs, you need the defense costs as well as damages to protect yourself on that. That's what your privacy liability insuring agreement would do for you. Moving over to network security liability. This is your failure, error, or omission, or negligence from preventing malicious code from leaving your network and affecting a third party's network. And just a very quick example of that is if you have an employee within your organization, they send an email out to your vendor or your client, and unbeknownst to them, they've got a virus attached to one of their their attachments. That virus opens up in the vendor or client's email or network system, and it brings their ability to transact business to a close. They cannot operate. They bring in a forensics team to identify what happened, and lo and behold, they trace that email back to your organization. Guess what? You've got a demand letter looking for that lost business income. So this here would be defense costs for that type of lawsuit. And again, any damages arising out of that. Mm -hmm. Media content liability. You all might be very surprised to learn that you have an exposure very similar to a publisher's company type of exposure. Because listen, at this point in time, we all have websites and we all put content out there. Guess what? We're responsible for that content. So anything that you put out there, you could be held liable for, again, for allegations of libel, slander, defamation, copyright and trademark infringement. 
So if you have your website that you're constantly updating or if you have any content that you're putting out on social media and advertising websites, please know that you have an exposure there. That seems so unfair, Michelle, but I'm sure it's a reality. It, it, it very much is a reality. So not everything's fair, Ramon. <laughs> so moving on, <laughs> one of the things that we've been talking a lot about with, with John Mullen and John Farley, um, uh, you know, regulatory oversight. This is an insurance agreement on the policies that's available today that provides you coverage for the defense against a regulatory investigation. And that means whether it be an informal inquiry, a formal inquiry or proceeding, and then the fines and penalties that are resulting from that investigation. You would have that coverage provided for. You'd also have coverage for the payment card industry violations. This group is not a governmental group, but they do have authority to say how you transact their credit cards. And there are a list of data security standards that they put together and say, if you are in violation of these, we have the right to come out and investigate. Again, you would have the defense for that investigation, as well as any costs uh, of fraudulent um, charges that are assessed to your company, and any fines and penalties arising out of that type of violation. So those are, those are the third-party liability uh, coverages that are available. But moving on, we also have first-party expenses that are provided as well. So business interruption, very similar to property policies that provide uh, lost business income. The only difference is on a cyber policy, it's going to provide you for lost business income due to any type of network intrusion that causes you a disruption, okay? On top of the lost business income that you would have provided for you, you would have the additional expenses for the extra expenses you incur to get your network back up and running again. Cyber extortion, this is the one that we are hearing a lot about lately, and it's, it's through ransomware types of events. When you have a bad actor that is able to get into your system and either encrypt your data or have the ability to delete or wipe your data from your system, they are looking for payment. You would have the payment available to you to either pay that ransom request and get your data back or to remove the threat that they could take your data or wipe it. There is also coverage for any type of data asset loss. This means that if you have any network intrusion and you have lost, stolen, or corrupted data assets, you would have those first-party expenses to restore, recollect, or recreate those data assets. Um, this is a particularly interesting one because data assets are different than your, your personally identifiable data in many cases. It's a lot of the data that you use on a day-to-day -to, -day to function. It could be your orders. It could be your invoices. It could be schedules. It could be anything that you use to function on a daily basis. And what has happened is malicious actors have been able to monetize that. So um, having this first-party expense, very valuable. And last but certainly not least on these types of policies, you would have costs to respond to the breach event itself. We've mentioned it uh, a few times on this call. When you have a data breach, you do have to respond in a certain manner. Okay, that means bringing in John Mullen and his team. That means bringing in the forensic IT team, which, by the way, is one of the fastest growing expenses post-breach. It also means bringing in the PR firm, setting up a call center, and providing notification and credit card monitoring. So, Ramon, as you can see, a lot of good coverages here that um, really take that risk off the balance sheet. Absolutely. Well done. Well done. I like this, and I think it's a great explanation because many people just don't know these things. Uh, Michelle, as we come to the kind of the, the uh, finalization of, this, of this, this part of the webinar, but again, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting ready to get into questions very, very soon. Um, uh, thank you, Michelle. John Farley, I'll turn to you. Just each person, maybe very quick summaries. Um, small businesses often think a breach can't happen to them. Recap that, John. Uh, summarize that for us as we come to an end here. Sure. So if it hasn't happened, there's a good chance that it will uh, in some form. Um, so what you need to do is manage cyber risk not only from a technology perspective, but from people and processes as well. So train your people to recognize the risk and, and set up multi-factor authentication. So have processes and, and controls in place 
to prevent it or mitigate a data breach if it does happen. So technology, people, and processes. Love it. Thank you very much. Michelle, again, you've outlined this very, very well for us, uh, but why don't you give the floor to you here, this aspect of uh, uh, data breaches uh, and insurance. I think I may have hit, let's see here. Uh, well, yeah, why don't you go ahead and cover that one? I think that is for, actually, John, I'm gonna, John Mullen, I'm going to turn that over to you. Uh, your aspects of small businesses think that data breach can't happen, can occur. Um, what are your thoughts on that as you summarize and bring us on that? I think we've driven home the point it does and it will occur. Uh, my question is, two, who, who are you going to call? Right. And second is, how, how are you going to pay? So ask yourself those two questions, and if you take them seriously, then you'll be, you'll be taking some steps here. Awesome. So we're at five minutes to the hour. Thank you all for your patience, but I hope it's been well. And we're going to dive into some questions here. Uh, John Mullen, John, uh, John Farley, and Michelle, maybe just one of you can answer it, and we can, you know, yes or no as best we can. We don't want to take too much more time, but um, maybe I'll turn it to you, John Mullen, and if you're not comfortable, whoever I turn to, just punt it to whoever you think can help answer it. But somebody asked about business credit. Uh, John Mullen, uh, can you, can you uh, freeze a credit score uh, in case something happens, should you do that as you do kind of with personal finances? How does that work in, in very brief uh, credit, business credit? The short answer is I'm not certain because most of the laws are structured around individuals. So right. my guess is you cannot, but I don't know that for certain. I know that you absolutely can for individuals. That's cool. And then uh, maybe I'll turn this to you, Michelle. Uh, bank account information, is that a target? Do, 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 do hackers want employee bank accounts or anything related to banks? That's with uh, Rena. Rena, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's part of the personally identifiable information. You know, if, if they can use that and, and they can monetize that, by all means, yes. Great. Absolutely. And, they, great. Want, they want what the information is in the front of your check. That's what they want. Got it. Uh, and Michelle, I'll turn this back to you since you kind of outlined for us the aspect about insurance. William asked a question. Uh, when is a company deemed negligent by the insurance carrier for their cybersecurity policies? And I'm sure this is a longer question, Michelle, but just in summary, give us some guidance on that if you can, please. So uh, just to repeat, so this, if the company is being negligent? Yes, I think the answer is that when will the insurance company say, hey, you didn't do something right here, so maybe we're not liable? That could be the question. Answer it as best you can. But is there any liability that we need to know related to the insurance company protecting us, I guess, is, might be the question. It's an open-ended question, just wondering probably the relationship between the insurance company and the business owner themselves. So there's going to be an application that qualifies a lot of the questions and how the underwriters risk this type of uh, – they rate this type of risk. Um, mm. At this point in time, it is a very competitive marketplace, and the coverage is very broad, both in terms of what is offered and how the policies are written. Um, the, the negligence factor would come down to an exclusion, which, you know, if you have a specialist, if you have a broker who is experienced in this area and knows how to negotiate those terms off of your policy, that will be a factor for you. I can't say that everybody is a specialist. I just know that this is a relevant business opportunity and people are placing it. But you want to make sure that you're, you're working with somebody who deals in this area specifically so they know what to remove from the policies to make it as broad as possible because they are not industry standard forms. These right. are, are very different carrier to carrier and can be very nuanced and you need to have a specialist really walking you through that and tailor making the policy to your business risk. Great. Thank you very much. John Farley, as you know, from our very highest elected officials to regular people like me and you, we use personal email, you know, Gmail, AOL, Yahoo, and in between. I hope nobody uses Prodigy still, Juno, and all these kind of services. So the question from a William again, and ask, thank you, William, is that uh, anything, and again, there's a lot I know to this answer, John Farley, but any thoughts on just how to protect ourselves from using these uh, consumer version email services? What do we do? Sure, there should be some spam filters set up to sort of weed out some of those uh, malicious emails, but um, also set up some controls. So if someone goes and compromises your credentials and looks to change the password, make sure there's a control in place and you can contact uh, any one of these email hosting sites and say, look, if someone's going to do that, I need a text, right? So if I'm going to change my, my credential password, there should be a text coming to me to my cell phone to indicate that that's happening. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, John Mullen, I'll turn this over to you, but again, you can you know, move what you want. Uh, somebody asked about BYOD, bring your own devices, which I know is a big, big issue. It's a big answer, of course, but man, what do you do with, you know, Ramon worked for John Bowen. Ramon wants to bring in his kid's iPad or something. What do we do with that, John? That's a whole other issue, it seems to me. Well, first of all, anytime you connect yet more devices, as John Farley indicated earlier, you're, you're spreading the risk and making it bigger. 
So to me, I'm, I'm not a big fan of bring your own device because it, it, it's also bring your additional problems. So I'm not a big fan of it. And, and you know, to me, you know, as, as a business owner myself, we don't do it yeah. for that reason. Got it. Um, Michelle, the government does uh, security exercises, you know, naval exercises, et cetera. So the question from James, should, should businesses kind of do uh, exercises, test their security? You know, I don't know, call John Mullen up by surprise and say, John, just test and make sure you're there. I kind of say it tongue in cheek, but the question is serious. And, and again, to repeat the question, should we somehow be testing any of this before the breach? I don't know how to do it, but that's what somebody asked. And that was James. He asked that question. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we can do to, to really mitigate or, or hopefully prevent losses in the future by understanding what your risks are. And there are a host of, of vendors that can provide those services to you. Like John Farley said, it could be vulnerability testing or penetration testing. Uh, there could be security assessments made of your overall network security. So doing those things prior to a breach are absolutely necessary in understanding what your risk is and how to shore up those risks to to prevent what what could be inevitable, right? Um, and I, I could add to that too. You know, if you have an incident response plan, you want to practice that plan, right? Do a simulation. So uh, let's go through a ransomware attack. What's going to happen? Who are you going to call? Who are you going to bring in? Um, make sure you practice that plan. Got it. Love it. And then uh, maybe, John Farley, I'll stick to you in answering this one. Uh, someone, This is from Claudine, and thank you, Claudine, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Um, any guidance to federal contractors? Uh, NIST requirements, I forgot what the acronym stands for, but the point is, I know, you know from NSA and others have all these kind of regulations and things for federal government contractors. Tips, thoughts, you know, two cents opinion just on what the government contractors can do to be more secure? Sure. NIST stands for the National Institute for Standards and Technology. And what this is, these are uh, best practices, if you will, that were put together by the best and brightest in Silicon Valley and in the federal government. And so it really outlines a lot of controls and the, the sort of roadmaps you should follow to secure your data. Um, so they're updating this on a regular basis, and NIST is one resource to go to and, and just to kind of follow that roadmap. Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of questions going, so I think what I'll do, unless uh, anyone on the operations team wants to text me, I think I'm going to take two more questions, I believe, uh, but someone can just text me and let me know yay or nay if I uh, should go longer, because uh, we have a lot here. But thank you all for the questions, and we'll try to get to them somehow. But I'll ask two more questions, and um, uh, I'll turn this over to you, Michelle. Um, so, well, somebody asked about personal protection. You know, I'll go ahead, Michelle, answer that. I mean, because I think business is personal. You have the corporate exec who goes home. Any thoughts, Michelle, just on how to protect our homes? Because, again, you bring the corporate laptop, the corporate device to your home network where there's all kind of devices on it. Thoughts, opinions on just how to integrate? You know, I go home, I go to my grandma's, I go to the hotel, but it's part of my business. What do I do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that you really need to reach out to your technology providers and make sure that you're being vigilant, number one, and you're, you're using as many safeties and precautions. You know, I, I know um, several individuals that do not use public Wi-Fi, and they don't even use um, password-protected Wi-Fi when they're at hotels or airports. What they do is they use hotspots because they feel that it's going to protect them. I am by no means the technology expert, and I don't want to be giving those types of recommendations, but I think that there are several of them that you could be doing, and I would say reach out to your, your technology providers on that. Great. And a lot of people have asked, uh, will the webinar and et cetera be replayed? How can we get it? Someone on the, on the production team, Inc. or Hub, I'm sure will reach out to those of you who asked that question. Some people, uh, Michelle, John, and John have said, please, can you do the webinar again? I want my IT team to hear it. So just sharing some of the data points. And I guess I'll just uh, I'll leave you with this, Michelle, because you talked about it. People are just asking a little bit about Hub and how much the insurance costs. I believe I saw somewhere in there at a minimal 1000 a year, give or take. But if you want to recap, Michelle, just you know, 101 of working with Hub or insurance in general, people are asking, you know, a little bit more about that, if you can elaborate. Absolutely. So I'm going to say that, that we have such a competitive marketplace. We have no shortage of carriers who are offering this type of insurance, which means that it is a great time to be a buyer of this insurance because you're getting very broad terms and very competitive rates. When we talk about small businesses, I can, I can throw this analytic out. I mean, if you are a small business with less than $2 million in annual revenues, you can likely get a policy as low as $1,000. For all of those insurance agreements that I had covered earlier on this call, which is a very robust policy inclusive of having access to John Mullen, his team, and a, and a, a, a list of vendors, 
that can help you, these experts that can help you get through these types of breaches. Super competitive, great time to buy. Excellent. So listen, with that, we're four minutes after the hour. I just want to respect the time of our panelists, respect the time of those who have dialed in, and thank you very much. I know some of you didn't have your specific question answered, but I'm sure the operations team behind producing this webinar will help and will help answer some of those. But my name is Ramon Ray with Smart Hustle, at Ramon Ray, uh, and really get big thanks to John Farley with Hub, big thanks to Michelle uh, with uh, Hub as well, big thanks to John Mullen, I'll call him a uh, Hub son, something like that, but he's the lawyer on the call, and uh, it's been great. And again, remember, check out the, use the hashtag strike back. Uh, Hub International's Twitter handle is uh, at Hub uh, Insurance. So you can find more information about them on behalf of Inc. Magazine. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Hub, for bringing us this webinar.